Welcome, and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions, which we'll ask throughout today's presentation. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE progress widget to open a PDF file that you can save to your computer. Don't worry if you can't download your PDF certificate today. We'll email a copy to you in two weeks. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet to receive CPE credit. The attendance sheet is available in the slide deck and handouts widget. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. Also note that CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and isn't available to participants who view the on-demand version. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Uh, before we begin, I would like to introduce today's presenters from Moss Adams Tax Credits and Incentives Team. Chris LaRue, partner, Jeff Schilling, Managing Director, and Jonathan Gates, Manager. And with that, I will turn it over to Jonathan to get us started. All right, well, thank you very much, Emily, and welcome everyone to the webcast. In today's agenda, we're going to cover a quick overview of the cash flow strategies around fixed assets and depreciation. For most of you who have joined our webcast before, this will just basically be an overview, but it's never a bad idea to get some quick update on what's happening there. We'll then jump into fixed asset changes and considerations in light of the recent COVID-related tax relief acts. We'll talk about key benefits related to energy efficient building deductions or 179D studies followed by 45L tax credit opportunities for home builders and residential rental developers. And we'll, follow, we'll finally follow up with the presidential election's potential impacts on fixed assets. We're gonna jump right into a polling question to start this off. All right, our first polling question for today, what are you most excited to get from this webcast? And your options are A, strategies to increase cash flow using fixed assets, B, energy efficient building construction tax savings. C, post election impacts to fixed assets and how to plan for potential changes. D, CPE credit. Or E, all of the above. And I'll give everyone a few moments to respond. To participate in our polls today, please click the button next to the answer you choose and hit submit. And just a few more seconds here. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the results. Back to you. Okay, great. Looks like we uh, have a, quite a few people looking for everything, which is, which is great. Um, and we're obviously gonna be covering all these items today. Uh, and then for those of you who are just looking for some CPE credit, we'll get that as well. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. We're gonna talk about first the various cash flow strategies using fixed assets and depreciation. The first opportunity I'd like to talk about today is something likely most of you are familiar with, and that is cost irrigation studies. In its essence, cost irrigation is a tax deferral strategy. The purpose of a cost irrigation study is to front load depreciation deductions 
into the early years of a taxpayer's life of owning those assets. Even though cost segregation is commonly used as a tax deferral strategy, many taxpayers aren't fully benefiting from this opportunity. These companies are often paying federal and state income taxes sooner than needed and missing the chance to significantly reduce their current income taxes. Cost segregation studies are used to identify assets in a building that might qualify for shorter depreciable lives. They identify property that can be depreciated over five, seven, 15 years, rather than the 27 and a half for residential property or 39 year for non-residential property. Five and seven year property would be section 1245 property, where a 15 year property would be exterior land improvements like parking lots, landscaping, sidewalk, or qualified improvement property, which we'll get into later. 27 and a half year residential property would include things like multi-property, multi-family property, and senior housing. 39 year non-residential real would essentially be all other commercial property. Cost irrigation studies are done not only for acquisitions and newly constructed buildings, but are also great for tenant improvements, projects, remodels, and expansions. The way to think about a cost irrigation study is this. Assume you had $100,000 of assets potentially eligible for shorter lives. Would you rather take a majority of the 100,000 deductions in the first year of owning that asset, or would you rather take 100,000 deduction spread out over 27 and a half year or 39 years? Assuming a taxpayer can utilize those deductions, the deductions are worth more today than they are in the future simply by the time value of money. So as I mentioned, there's quite a few types of construction or cost irrigation studies. Basically any acquired property and all types of construction projects, ground up construction, remodel, expansion, tenant improvements, can make sense to have a study completed. If the property was purchased through a 1031 exchange, a cost irrigation study might be beneficial if the new depreciable basis is high enough to justify the study, of course. These studies can be completed on a look back basis through an automatic accounting method change or a form 3115. A taxpayer could catch up the depreciation missed on prior tax returns by taking those deductions in the year that they file a 3115. And this can be done without amending any prior returns. So why do taxpayers want this done? Well, simply put, it increases cash flow. It allows taxpayers to recapture depreciation deductions sooner, which can then be reinvested somewhere else. Or if a taxpayer is in a lost position, but expected to be taxable soon, for instance, they have expiring credits or they used up some of their carry forward losses, it might make sense to have a cost irrigation completed. And it also depends on what the taxpayer's current and future goals are. Typically for ground up new construction projects or acquired projects, private properties, a good low end threshold is about a million dollars to make sense of a cost irrigation study. Or for interior improvements, the low end is closer to $250,000. And because of the time value of money and depreciation recapture, a taxpayer who holds onto the property for more than five years would benefit more than if he held onto the property for one or two years or three years even, although that can vary from taxpayer to taxpayer. Here I have a chart. The purpose of this chart is to show the typical reclassification percentages of various industry types. For instance, as you can see, for a $1 million asset assisted living facility, there could be anywhere from 20 to 35% of property allocable to shorter pushable lives, meaning $250,000 to $350,000 of accelerated depreciation. Take a look at the chart and see if you can find the industry you're a part of. Hopefully this gives you an idea or a general idea of the general classification ranges for cost irrigation studies. Next, I wanna talk about bonus and the history behind bonus depreciation. It was first introduced in 2001, and over a 15-year time period, there were varying levels of bonus depreciation, 30%, 50%, 100%, and in some cases, not at all. The PATH Act of 2015 brought the changes that would have bonus depreciation at 50% in 2016 and 2017, and then phased down for two years, and then finally phased out in 2020. The current law that we're under, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, PCJA, provided changes to bonus depreciation that would last nearly a decade. The change was retroactive to qualified property placed in service after September 27, 2017. It not only increased bonus from 50 to 100%, but allowed acquired property to be eligible for bonus. Pretty significant. With the TCGA, the bonus percentages phased down by 20% starting in 2023 and then completely phased out in 2027. Bottom line, bonus depreciation is a very powerful tool that can really enhance the benefits of a cost irrigation study, but it's important to understand 
which act the asset would fall under. Next, I want to talk through fixed asset studies. Similar to a cost segregation study, a fixed asset study is designed to reduce the federal and state tax liabilities. However, it is applied on a broader scale, as opposed to focusing on a single real estate asset. This type of study is accomplished by reviewing a company's depreciation schedules and applying the appropriate tax law to all fixed assets. Incentives are found in each asset's ability and eligibility for accelerated depreciation through bonus, QIP, or even just a correction in the asset's lives and methods. This is most useful for companies who have more than 25 million in fixed asset holdings. They operate out of multiple physical locations or business units with a decentralized accounting team and for those who self-manage fixed assets for tax. Let's go ahead and go into another polling question here. All right, our second polling question. Do you find it difficult to keep track of book to tax differences in managing your fixed assets? And your options are A, yes, we need all the help we can get. B, we do well enough, but interested in ways to be more efficient and increase deductions. C, nope, we got it taken care of, or D, I have no clue. As a reminder, if you would like to receive CPE credit for today's webcast, you will need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions. We'll give everyone a couple more seconds to respond. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the results. Jonathan, back to you. Yes. Um, yeah, well, this is great. This is great to see. Um, obviously, there is kind of a mixed feeling here, but a majority saying we do well enough, but are interested in ways to be more efficient uh, and increase those deductions. Um, that's good to know. Um, especially, you know, we see this, we see this with a lot of our clients as well. Um, they do well enough, but are obviously looking for ways to, to increase some deductions, create some cash flow, and, and maybe be a little more in compliance with the different kind of regs out there. So, oddly enough, oftentimes the taxpayer is unaware of the nuances and differences in compliance issues for tax versus gap. We especially see this in our larger, more asset-heavy taxpayers where additions and fixed assets are in the $100 million range. Managing your fixed assets can be cumbersome, and the taxpayer is likely to be missing areas to accelerate deductions or to remain in compliance. Some common areas we typically see include not taking bonus or 179 expense when applicable, using the incorrect recovery period on assets, capitalizing repairs and routine maintenance, neglecting to use special recovery periods such as QIP, QLIP, QRP, and QRIP, and even never even placing an asset in service. With the fixed asset study, the options are twofold. First, take a one-time look at a taxpayer's books to identify areas to accelerate deductions on assets previously placed in service, and two, or secondly, provide an ongoing annual or quarterly assessment of additions and provide proper lives and methods. Both of these can lead to immediate tax deductions for the owners. For example, in a fixed asset study, we have identified areas such as manufacturing clients, booking assets, and long life categories when they qualify for a shorter life, such as heavy equipment integrated into their manufacturing building, restaurant and retail clients not taking advantage of qualified restaurant property or qualified retail property, especially during the 2004 to 2017 timeframe, and QIP going forward from 2018, and other real estate clients incorrectly classifying building property. Most of these clients were seeing upwards of $4 million in increased deductions through these missed opportunities. Fixed asset studies can also open opportunities for disposing assets that have been mistakenly remained on the fixed asset schedule even when the physical asset itself has been abandoned or removed. We refer to these as ghost assets. This can be beneficial for personal property tax reporting as well. For example, let's, just, let's imagine a taxpayer purchased a large office building in 1995. In 2005, the taxpayer renovates the first floor of the, of the building to accommodate a new tenant space. Then 10 years later, in 2015, a taxpayer once again renovates the first floor for typical tenant turnover. And finally, in 2020, through a fixed asset study, it is found that the taxpayer is still depreciating the 2005 assets, which were replaced in the 2015 remodel. The taxpayer is allowed and able to file a county method change to claim the loss for those 2005 assets that were replaced in 2015 on their 2020 return. Next, 
let's talk through tangible property regulations or TPR studies. Companies generally adopted the TPR regulations during the 2012 to 2015 timeframe. Now that we're coming out of the five-year window, it's a good time to revisit TPR to see how com your compliance with the TPR regs have been going. And the internal revenue procedures now allow to follow for you guys to follow another accounting method change under the TPR reg now that the five-year lockout has expired. TPR covers a vast array of fixed asset capitalization and expensing procedures. So today we're only gonna focus on two key benefit areas we have found for our clients. The first is overcapitalization opportunities. This occurs when a taxpayer has treated costs as a tax deductible repair and maintenance expenditure as a depreciable fixed asset. Often they're radically depreciating those costs of these repair and maintenance activities over 27 and a half or 39 years, rather than claiming the full deductions they're entitled to take in the first year. We refer to this as overcapitalized repair issue. We often identify this issue for companies that have numerous real estate fixed asset holdings. Buildings constantly require upkeep and maintenance, and building owners also perform elective projects remodels based on the underlying business needs. With all these activities associated with real estate, it can become challenging to apply the guidance and the tangible property regulations for treating the associated costs as a capital improvement or as a tax deductible repair maintenance expense. The regulations guide us to consider several qualitative and quantitative factors of the current activity done to a building, as well as the impact to specific building structure systems and system components. A repair study is a great solution to identify overcapitalized repair issues for your company. The key benefits of this type of study are the ability to catch up on mixed repair deductions from prior years, and then after the process of a repair study, many taxpayers are more oriented or familiarized with regulations and how to apply them. And finally, it provides a consistent CapEx policy on a go-forward basis. Again, why consider this now? The regulations were issued in 2014. Many filed accounting method changes at that time to comply with the guidance and the regulations. Whether or not you acted on the opportunity to look back in prior years, now is a great time for a five-year check-in and to see how your compliance with the TPR regs have been going. The second opportunity we wanted to cover in light of tangible property regulations are PDE studies, or partial disposition election studies. These have a strong likelihood to be more prevalent these days due to the natural disasters, such as wildfires, which have riddled our land and created significant damage to many taxpayers' businesses. But how do they work? PDE studies are used to identify the basis of a disposed asset that is lumped into a single asset, such as a building on the taxpayer's depreciation schedule. Once again, or however, once a taxpayer renovates an existing building, demolishing portions of the building to accommodate the new updates, they're afforded the opportunity to write off the basis in the disposed asset. As long as there's remaining basis in the building, a PDE study can be used to reduce tax liability and free of cash. PDE opportunities can also be beneficial in the event of a casualty resulting in the receipt of insurance proceeds. Through a PDE study, the damaged portion of the building can be disposed, creating deductions to reduce the gain realized from the insurance proceeds. To better explain this, let's go ahead and take a look at this example. I've laid out some facts here. Let's assume that on July 1, 2012, a taxpayer purchases a mixed-use office building with a large warehouse space used for light storage, light manufacturing for about $20 million. Then eight years later, on June 1, 2020, the taxpayer's warehouse is significantly damaged by a fire. September 1, 2020, a few months later, they renovate the warehouse back to new for a total of $4.5 million. By conducting a PDE study, a loss was created of $3.4 million, which can then be used to offset insurance proceeds due to the casualty loss, a much better solution than to not do a PDE at all. The final area I want to discuss are the key changes to fixed assets and recent COVID-related tax relief acts. Although there were important changes to energy efficient building deductions and credits, specifically pertaining to when they can be claimed, I want to um, focus mainly on the updates to qualified improvement property and NOL carrybacks. Later, Jeff will discuss the energy efficient building deductions and credits. So before we get into the changes, let's first talk about what QIP really is. Qualified improvement property is any improvement made by a taxpayer to the interior portion of a building, which is non-residential real property. These improvements have to be placed in service after the date the building itself was first placed in the service. 
Certain improvements are excluded from the definition of qualified improvement property. These would include expenditures related to the enlargement of a building, so that means going up or off the side, any escalators or elevators, any internal structural framework to a building, so for example, seismic retrofits to the building's beams and foundations or maybe floor structure changes, and also excludes any improvements made to the exterior of a building. So for instance, there would be exterior windows, doors, paint, rooftop HVAC units, exterior lighting, and so on and so forth. It is also worth noting that QIP is not eligible for newly constructed buildings or for improvements in an acquired building or an acquired leasehold improvement because the taxpayer acquiring those assets would need to be the one who made the improvements. So what changed in the CARES Act? The CARES Act provided a technical correction to qualified improvement property that many of us have been waiting for. The technical correction retroactive to January 1, 2018 change the recovery period for QIP from 39 years to 15 years, which also makes it eligible for bonus. Under the alternative depreciation system, ADS, QIP was changed to 20 years from the 40 years it originally was at. And lastly, the CARES Act added the language made by the taxpayer to the definition, again, to clear up the confusion about acquired assets. So why is it such a big deal? Now that QIP is eligible for 15 year life with bonus, it provides a significant tax planning opportunity. During a time of economic uncertainty like we're experiencing right now, cash is king. And QIP is a great way to generate immediate cash to taxpayers during this time. QIP can be especially powerful when coupled with the net operating loss carryback opportunity in the CARES Act, which I'll talk about here in a second. Changes, uh, because taxpayers may be able to generate permanent tax savings using the tax rate arbitrage, of a lower federal tax rate that was created in TCJA. Here's an example of how significant the QIP, QIP change is. Let's assume $5 million for QIP placement service in July of 2018, eligible for bonus. Prior to the CARES Act, there was little difference between GDS and ADS because both had a high life, 39 years and 49, or 40 years, and they were not eligible for bonus, so nearly $60,000 in depreciation in both cases there. After the CARES Act, the difference is significant. With GDS for QIP at 15 years eligible for bonus, the entire $5 million can be deducted immediately. And ADS life at 20 years at 20 year life can now also be increased to amount, but obviously a lot smaller due to the fact that it's not eligible for bonus. Finally, the CARES Act restored the five year net operating loss, NOL, carry back for losses arising in any taxable year beginning after 2017 and before 2021. This means that companies that had a net operating loss for 2018 can immediately request a refund by filing a form 1139 to apply the loss, carrying forward any amount they did not use. The act also allows 100% offset of taxable income, suspending the 80% limitation that was, placed in, uh, that was placed under TCJA. To further assist in making the refund claims, the IRS has implemented temporary procedures that allow taxpayers to fax it in rather than mail in the re refund claim. Care should be taken for any ownership changes that have occurred during the three years leading up to the loss as the amount of loss may be limited. This is a critical piece that many are not aware of. The rules are complex, so please consult your tax advisor. The act allows a taxpayer to decide to carry the loss back or carry it forward. An election can be made for each separate year, 2018, 19, or 20. Most companies will benefit by choosing to carry the loss back because the TCJA lowered the corporate tax rate from 35% to 21% beginning in 2018. This means that instead of receiving $21 of benefit for every $100 of loss carried forward, a corporation could receive $35 if I carry back, a permanent difference. Example here. You can see how a food processing company was able to take advantage of the NLL carryback and the tax rate arbitrage for a permanent tax difference savings, 700,000 in tax deferral versus 420,000. And next I'll pass it on to Jeff to talk about energy incentives for commercial and real estate residential sectors. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, appreciate all that good information. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being with us. This morning, uh, as Jonathan indicated, we're going to talk about uh, energy incentives for commercial and residential buildings or properties. 
First of all, what's widely, widely referred to as Section 179D, which is the Energy Efficient Commercial Building Deduction. Uh, we're going to talk about that's been permanently extended by the most recent COVID stimulus, stimulus action taken by the previous administration and, and budgetary action, which dealt with a number of what are generally the tax extenders. Uh, and as part of that, 179D was made permanent. Uh, you may have heard me emphasize the fact that this is a deduction, not a credit. So as we get into the details, keep in mind that it's akin to bonus depreciation, giving you an instant write-off for what would otherwise be 39-year building property. So what is the Section 179D deduction? It's a deduction from a commercial building of up to $1.80 per square foot that is available for newly constructed buildings or building improvements that meet certain energy efficient standards. Uh, so it came in, was originally enacted in 2006, uh, and it is available going back as far as you have open years, open tax years, through amended returns. So uh, if you had activity that qualifies in a previous year, you can do a method change, which allows you to take the deduction in the current year without amending returns. The deduction can be claimed by owners and tenants of commercial buildings, whoever's made the improvements. Uh, it also applies to residential buildings as long as they're more than four stories. Uh, and, those, uh, and again, new construction or uh, improvements made to those buildings. Government also recognized that many of these improvements uh, are being made to buildings owned by non-taxpayers. And in those cases, for government-owned energy-efficient projects, buildings or improvements, the deduction can be claimed by the designer, either architect, engineer, or contractor that played the primary role in the design of the qualifying system. Uh, and that also can be claimed uh, via 3115 or amended returns. So what exactly is the energy efficient building deduction? As I said, it's a $1.80 per square foot uh, for energy efficient savings or energy savings that are more than 50% uh, of the standard. And that standard is a uh, produced by ASHRAE, but you can see what the, that acronym stands for down at the bottom. So in each case, the building has to be modeled and the system is highlighted against the standard versus what was actually installed to see if it actually delivers the uh, energy savings. And it, the buck 80 is broken down into 60 cents per square foot for the HVAC system, interior lighting re retrofits, and then the building envelope. And the property or the improvement can qualify on those areas individually uh, or together to make the buck 80 per square foot. The energy performance uh, modeling has to be completed and then signed off by uh, a contractor or professional engineer licensed in the jurisdiction, the state, where the building is located. Let's go through a quick example for you all. So you can see that given the $1.80 per square foot of the fact that it's measured uh, or the benefits are derived on an area basis, this is going to make more sense for larger buildings. So in the case of 50,000 square foot building, you know, pretty easy to do the math. <clears throat> the maximum deduction available is a buck 90. Real simple with a 100,000 square foot building, of course, 60, 60, 60, or 180,000. Uh, the other thing a lot of people don't realize is the, given that it qualifies, that lighting retrofits qualify, is that this would also apply to parking garages uh, that many oftentimes are not enclosed buildings, and so people are not sure that those qualify, but they in fact do. 
So that's the 179D, and again, a deduction for energy efficient commercial buildings. Now let's roll into residential benefits for residential dwelling units. Uh, and this is section 45L. It's been around uh, on a reoccurring basis, one year, two years at a time, uh, since 2006. And section 45L, the energy efficient home credit, and again, credit has been extended by that most recent act we talked about until December 31st, 2021. So it had previously was set to expire at the end of 2020. And the, so what the 45L is, is a credit of $2,000 per dwelling unit for those dwelling units that move, meet certain geofficient standards. And it's available for the contractor that con constructs or substantially renovates dwelling units. Uh, and eligible contractor is defined as the taxpayer that has a basis in the property while it was being constructed. So you can be the taxpayer owner uh, and defined as the eligible contractor if you have a contractor or third party that is completing the construction for you as long as you have basis in the property that's being constructed. So what that means is that trusts, estates, partnerships, or individuals that hire that third party contractor, they can qualify as the eligible contractor and therefore uh, qualify for the credit. Eligible dwelling units, uh, as you would immediately imagine, refers to single family homes, but also, and, and less known, or sometimes uh, we have clients that are a little skeptical, it also applies to dwelling units that are delivered in a multifamily setting, so apartments, townhomes, duplexes, condos, uh, and it, they don't have to be sold units, they just have to be delivered units. So once you have a lease in place for that unit, you can qualify for the credit. It also includes senior housing facility, uh, houseboats and trailer homes, although the credit for manufactured homes uh, that meet the energy criteria, and the criteria is a little lower for the manufactured homes, but the credit's $1,000 per unit, meeting the 30% uh, energy efficient or energy savings, whereas for the $2,000 credit, the uh, home has to perform 50% better or realize 50% energy savings uh, from being modeled. And while that sounds somewhat daunting, there are uh, a number of states, California being the most prominent, that have energy efficiency standards in their building code that essentially automatically qualify for the 50% greater than the uh, standard home. And, the, and again, much like the 179D, the energy efficient certification must be completed by a qualified third party, generally a HERS rater. Uh, and again, the credit can be claimed in prior tax years, uh, open years, of course, by amending tax returns. Uh, we have a number of clients that have found this to be extremely lucrative uh, for them on a look-back basis and, and a go-forward basis. That takes us into another polling question, which is, right. how likely are you... Oh, go ahead. Okay, our next polling question, uh, how likely are you to take advantage of these energy efficiency tax benefits? And your options are A, unlikely, B, likely for commercial buildings, C, likely for residential units, or D, I would like to learn more about them. And for those of you that would like a copy of today's slide deck, you can download them now from the folder that says slide deck and handouts to the right of the slide view. We will also be sending the slides via email after the webcast. We'll give everyone a couple more seconds here to make a selection. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the results. Back to you. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris LaRue to share with us uh, post-election impacts to fixed assets uh, expectations coming from the new administration. Thanks for your time. Take it away, Chris. Thanks, Jeff. 
we thought it'd be a good idea to just a lot of what we've been talking about thus far is is related to tax credits and tax deferrals and we have a, a new administration so we thought it'd be a good idea to give just some context on the impact of some of these provisions vis-a-vis uh, -vis potential tax law changes from the new administration that's been in office all of five days <laughs> so a lot of what we'll be talking about is is planning and timing and also you know the, the current makeup uh, of of Congress and what that might mean uh, for tax policy. So we're in a bit of a historical time. It's, it's one of the narrowest majorities there's been in, in history. As you can see, the, the Democrats will control all three um, offices. They have a, a slight majority in the House. It's currently 11 seats. There are two vacancies. Uh, one, the 22nd District of New York, which is at one point was about a six vote difference the, currently there's a, a republican that's leading by about 350 votes um it's caught up in the courts as you can imagine with recounts and and um trying to you know find out what ballots are legitimate it's it's a very very tight election uh, the republicans currently leading the second vacancy was a republican elect who um died uh, in between getting elected. So they're having a special election on March 20th. So we, we really don't, won't know the balance uh, of the House for a couple months. Um, it's very likely the Louisiana seat will be another Republican. And, and currently, the, the seat in New York is also trending that way. The Senate, with the election in Georgia, um, Democrats won both seats. And now it's a 50-50 split. Um, in that situation, uh, Vice President Harris would break a tie in the event of a 50-50 seat. So effectively, the Democrats have control. Um, Chuck Schumer would be the is the majority leader. Um, they just had a power sharing agreement. So um, the Democrats will be chairman of the committees, which which is real important with setting policy. Um, they have an equal number of members on the committee. There was there was recently a, a, a power sharing agreement, which is related to that. There's some precedent. The Bush administration had a 50-50 tie as well, where, where Dick Cheney, Vice President Cheney, set the tie-breaking vote. So um, seemingly a, a lot of momentum for Biden's policies because he has control. There's, there's narrow majorities, which is going to make it very difficult. You're going to hear a lot about about moderate Democrats and moderate Republicans um, wielding a lot of power in this situation. Um, Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia, um, the Kristen Sinema of Arizona, they come up a lot, they're moderate Democrats, so they're, they're gonna need to be involved in, in most of the policies in order for it to get through. Um, on the Republican side, you have um, Susan Collins in Maine and, and Mitt Romney comes up a lot, Lisa Murkowski. Uh, that moderate wing is going to wield a lot of power in the House. You're going to have a lot of caucusing. You know, there's there was the Freedom Caucus, the Congressional Black Caucus. They can get together and, and vote as a block and wield a lot of power in such a narrow narrow majority. So it's it's going to be interesting on the impact of these various caucuses uh, and what how they're going to be able to influence the, the tax policy. Another thing. Um, that we'll talk about a little bit is the various mechanisms for for passing bills in this in this narrow uh, narrow Congress. We have you know two things that come up come up a lot. You'll be hearing more and more about them in the news. The filibuster. That's a procedure where the minority party can effectively have an unlimited debate on a bill, um, which the impact is they basically hold up the bill um, uh, forever. Uh, and in order to end the debate, it requires 60 votes. So you, you really, it's difficult to pass controversial bills um, when the party doesn't have more than 60 votes. And, and right now, the Democrats obviously basically have 50 plus a tie-breaking vote. So the filibuster is going to be a common common thing. Um, the, both parties do it. It's it's the way the Senate is kind of distinguished from the House, and that it's not just a straight majority uh, rule on on a lot of bills. Um, Minority Leader McConnell was just trying to get them to agree not to uh, abolish the filibuster. The filibuster has been around a long time. There's some pressure on Democrats um, from the, the 
the more left wing of their party to abolish it so they're not caught up in, in this endless gridlock or, or a lot of people feel it's controversial because it gives the minority a lot of power to, to stop debate and stop bills. So um, he was trying to get an agreement for them to agree not to do it. He had two senator, two Democrat senators that came out publicly saying they would not vote to abolish the filibuster. So, you know, wait and see on that one. It'd be a pretty drastic thing. They have, they have done it for um, uh, approving judges. Um, that happened. Harry Reid did it initially. They referred to it as the nuclear option. Um, uh, the Democrats filibustered Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch. Uh, uh, Harry Reid first did it with a lot of federal judges. Um, Gorsuch uh, was filibustered, and then McConnell did the, what they called the nuclear option, where they, they did away with it for nominating judges, but they haven't done it with legislation. And, and some of the old guard senators who really believe in the institution and, and traditionalists are, are generally against uh, abolishing it because it's been around for so long. So, you know, how does, uh, how does a party with less than 60 votes get things through? Well, there's something called the budget reconciliation. And this is something that allows for a, a 51 vote or 50 plus the vice president tiebreak plus the vice president casting the tiebreaking vote to pass legislation. And, and the, the key here is there's some a lot of limitations. One, it has to be budget related. Um, uh, tax policy falls under this category. So. They have to do it once per fiscal year. It has to be part of the, the budget process. And um, it can only be done once a year. And it requires 50 plus votes. And there's some limitations on it. Um, so that is something that was done for the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, President Trump's tax bill was passed through budget reconciliation. So a lot of reason why you know there's some limitations on this 10-year window where it can't add to the deficit. That's why. I mean, Jonathan was talking about bonus depreciation, how it expires in 2027. Not a coincidence that it's 10 years after 2017 when it was first enacted. But you know, this this is a fairly complex process. It takes timing and planning, um, and it's going to be necessary for it to be part of the fiscal year. There's there's discussion right now that it's going to be part of the, the COVID relief bill, the 1.9 trillion dollar one that's been kicked around is going to require budget reconciliation to pass, which, which would push any tax policy away a year. But we'll, we'll talk more about timing at the end. All right, so it's, uh, it's uh, over. We'll get down to what Joe Biden's tax plan was. So the, on the business front, the biggest, most significant thing, and maybe the thing that may have the most bipartisan support is raising the corporate tax rate from 21% to 28%, still far less than it was uh, before the TCJA, uh, but a significant increase nonetheless. Um, also, he had a lot of talk during his campaign on on companies paying no taxes despite making, you know, having huge profits on their financial statements. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about that, and, and kind of a theme of his tax bills is is having a, you know higher income either companies or earners pay pay additional taxes. So in that sense, companies with more than $100 million of book, com, book income would pay 15% minimum tax on their book profits, so a, a major difference uh, in how tax is calculated now. Um, details of that are, are still to be decided. And some, some countries do this uh, outside of the United States. Uh, their tax bill is, is largely based on book income, be very new for us. Um, but that was his plan. It didn't, doesn't apply because the threshold is very high. We're, we are talking about a limited number of companies. $100 million of, of book income um, is substantial. Uh, also, phasing out the qualified business income deduction, also known as the pass-through deduction for taxpayers earning over $400,000. Um, that was one of his plans. Bonus depreciation. So there's there's been some form of bonus depreciation um, up for the last 12 years and for all but three of the last 20 years. Um, he wasn't specific on that, but, but there's a general support to do away with provisions that are benefiting, you know, highly profitable companies. He, he also had discussions about um, the real estate industry specifically uh, and their, their tax advantages on, on certain areas. So um, 
nothing specific, but, but that could be one to look out for. Manufacturing credit, um, enacting a, a, what do you call the manufacturing communities credit uh, related to, you know, renovating, updating uh, facilities that are manufacturing, uh, domestic facilities that are manufacturing. He, he actually signed an executive order yesterday, um, kind of a, a, a Buy American theme. Um, this would kind of fall into that category, you know, somehow incentivizing people to build and hire and, and, and not... Uh, um, just by American in, in general, so it was yesterday. On the real estate front, um, the biggest one was the removal of the uh, like kind exchange. There's been, you know, the history of, of the like kind exchange dates back to the 20s, not in its current form, but some format of it. This is a, a tax deferral where you, um, a lot of half times happens you trade facilities, you sell one facility, and then you can defer the gain by buying another facility for those that aren't familiar with it. This would do away with that that advantage of deferring the capital gain. You would you would pay the capital gain upon sale. Other provisions, expanding the, the low income housing tax credit, uh, uh, also a credit for first time home buyers, and then a, a renter's tax credit as well is on his plan. For individuals, he would revert the top tax rate back to a uh, pre-Tax Cuts and Jobs Act rate of 39.6%. Of it's currently 37%, and this would be for, for those with income over $400,000 a year. Um, the payroll tax, uh, you know, fairly significant change on payroll tax. Right now, there's a, there's a cap, most everyone knows, of wages up to, uh, it's currently $137,700. It adjusts for inflation each year. He would reinstitute the percentage for income above $400,000. So, so you wouldn't pay anything in between $137,000 and $400,000, but everything above that would be subject to the 12.4% the um, payroll tax. So a, a little word, so we have all these provisions, you know, obviously there's others, they're not really related to, to fixed assets. There's, you know, he's uh, changing the calculation for the 401k deduction. There's things about the work opportunity tax credits, a lot of others that don't fall into fixed assets. So the, then the question is, you know, how, how likely are these to pass and what would the timing be? So when I, I Look at new administrations and tax policy. I, I generally go to to history and, and what traditionally has happened. I know someone said once history has uh, has a tendency to repeat itself until it doesn't, but that's what we have is history and what they're talking about. So as far as timing, you, you know, I, tax policy was isn't really a passion of of Joe Biden's. He has these specific. He's very likely to do something. But is the urgency, obviously, we know it's, it's not an urgent issue right away for his administration. He's very busy. He has an impeachment trial. There's cabinets to still be uh, nominated and, and approved. There's staffing. There's the COVID uh, relief bill. There's getting vaccines out. We're in a sluggish economy, so there, there's a bit of headwind into raising taxes right now on the administration. Um, Janet Yellen, who was approved to be the Treasury Secretary yesterday, um, in her testimony indicated that it wasn't a focus of the administration, his uh, raising taxes right now. So a, a pretty significant thing for the Treasury Secretary to stay, who, who basically is the promoter of the president's financial policy, including tax. Um, Steve Mnuchin was it for Trump, who is you know, very active in promoting the, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So also some headwinds is the budget reconciliation. They've talked about using it for the COVID relief bill, which would put it off till the next fiscal year. You can only do reconciliation once per fiscal year. The odds of getting 10 Republicans to avoid a, a filibuster on um, tax increases are very long, pretty much impossible. Um, so, so there's some headwinds on having this uh, happen. Just for a historical perspective, you had um, when President Obama got elected, he ran on on the Bush tax cuts, you know, doing away with the Bush tax cuts. He had a, actually had a supermajority in the Senate and the House, and in two years did nothing to to do away with the Bush tax cuts, largely because the economy wasn't 
wasn't he he kind of uh his first two years the economy was kind of sluggish not only that when he he ended up losing the house in the midterms he actually signed a bill that extended the bush tax cuts two years so so it's really hard to predict uh what the, how much the campaign policies will be enacted when you have all these variables you know we have the ultimate variable of a pandemic and and also the economy which is closely related to to the pandemic so hard to predict um timing wise he, he does have a two year window he probably is unlikely to wait for his third year because you have also have a midterm election the party in charge of the presidency generally loses seats in the house during the midterm election i'm sure he's trying to avoid that so passing a tax bill in 2022 um via the reconciliation process is is a, a distinct possibility which which would likely apply to 2023 um, taxes we, we haven't had a retroactive tax increase since the clinton administration so that's fairly unusual in our history but you know things things can change um all right. Back to uh our last polling question. All right. Our final polling question for today, would a potential tax rate increase affect your tax planning and decisions in 2021? And your options are A, definitely, B, not likely, C, maybe in some areas, or D, prefer to wait until it is official. And once you have completed all CPE requirements today, you will be able to download a PDF of your CPE certificate from the CPE progress window to the right of the slide view. We'll give everyone a, a couple more seconds to respond here. All right, let's go ahead and see what everyone had to say. Great, thank you so much for your responses. Uh, we do have some time left for Q&A. So if you have a question you'd like to ask our presenters, you may submit that in the Q&A window. We have gotten quite a few already, so I'll get started on those. Uh, let's see here. What percent of businesses do you think don't do this? You said many, over or under 50%. And this one came in uh, near the beginning of the presentation. Yes, uh, I believe that's for me. And I, and I believe that question was pertaining to cost irrigation studies, saying that many people do not take advantage of of uh, cost irrigation studies, um, even though that they are there and they are known as a tax deferral strategy. Um, and, it, and it is tough to say, um, you know, more so, obviously, you know, um, the industry of cost irrigation has been growing quite a bit um, over the years, and more people are becoming more and more aware of that. Um, and so it's hard to put exact percentage on that, but I do, you know, I do believe, you know, especially with as our clients come in, um, you know, bringing this opportunity up to them, it is something that, you know, is an eye opener to them. It's something they have never heard before. And in some cases, they have heard heard of it, and and sometimes, you know, just basically didn't know how to implement it or didn't know the right avenues or where to look and so on and so forth. So um, the opportunities are there. Uh, I think it's just important to kind of get this out there to the industry and let everybody know that, hey, this isn't uh, a tax deferral strategy. It is a widely accepted uh, tax deferral strategy. Uh, and there are opportunities out there, even if you might not think that you have those, you know, within your own industry. I hope that answers the question. Okay. Uh, let's go with the depreciation convention for QIP under the CARES Act. Would that be MSL or MCRS 150% declining? Yeah, and I believe I answered that one individually right on there. But yeah, to anybody else that's curious in that as well. Um, so if qualified improvement property would be uh, depreciated with a, a half year and a straight line method um, in convention. So. Thank you. Our next question is, would Section 45L apply to dormitory buildings? The 45L credit uh, is for dwelling units, and that is typically interpreted to mean capable of independent living. So it uh, doesn't apply to hotels. Uh, our interpretation is it also wouldn't apply to dormitory buildings where that's just a sleeping space where the uh, 
you know, kitchen or food prep is not capable for that unit or there is not a separate restroom uh, for that unit. So if we're looking at a facility that has just sleeping rooms and shared restrooms and community uh, eating facilities, those will not, you know, typically, not typically, it will not apply for the credit. Hope that answers the question. Thanks. Um, and this actually is another one for Jeff. Does the 45L credit apply to someone who purchases single family residences, refurbishes them and uses them for rental like Airbnb? So the 45L credit will apply for significant renovation. Uh, so if you are adding insulation, improving the efficiency of the HVAC unit, um, windows, uh, there are a variety of different characteristics of the building that will make it obviously more energy efficient. Uh, however, the issue is, is that being delivered to a taxpayer? I'd have to look into that specifically. My initial gut is, no, uh, if the taxpayer is doing it for themselves for to uh, you know make income from that property, I don't think so. It doesn't apply to hotels, um, which is you know akin to how you're using the property. So uh, I can look into it further if you wish, uh, but the my my initial gut is uh, no, it will not. Great, thank you. Our next question, on the payroll tax for individuals, change post-election, is there any information on if this would include pass-through income? Meaning, would an individual be required to catch up their 12.4% payroll tax for pass-through income that puts them above the $400,000 threshold? So, unfortunately, the, the devil on a lot of these tax changes is in the details. We don't have any information, or I'm not aware of any information on the specifics of, of how it would be calculated. My sense would be similar to how it's currently calculating, just, just with different different thresholds, um, just a different dollar amount to what we know. Thank you. Um, let's see, we probably have time for one more question. How would a contractor or architect best request the Section 179D deduction from a government entity? Would they put it in the contract? I uh, could do it that way. What the government requires is proof from the building owner of the manner in which the deduction has been allocated. So it can be allocated. Uh, so the building owner is in control of how it's allocated, but as you can imagine with numerous uh, designers involved in the energy efficient characteristics, uh, there is no formula that says, well, X has to go to the lighting designer or the HVAC contractor. Uh, but what the government wants then with the filing or to, within the, the backup support for the 179D deduction is a letter indicating from the owner that says 100%, 50%, 30% is being allocated to XYZ designer uh, associated with the energy efficiency. Uh, and it's fairly standard practice, uh, the format of that letter uh, that the designer would provide the owner uh, and get their, get their signature uh, and the allocation percentage on. Great, thank you. And that is just about all the time we have today for questions. Um, if you think of another question for our presenters, definitely feel free to reach out to them directly. Uh, thank you all for the questions that you did ask. And a huge thank you to Jeff, Chris, and Jonathan for a great presentation today. As a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet found in the slide deck and handouts window to the right of the slide view. If you participated as an individual and met all certification requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window. I'll keep the webcast console open for a few minutes to give you time to download your CPE certificate. A copy of your CPE certificate will be emailed within three weeks should you have any difficulty in downloading it now. 
And when I close out the presentation, you will see an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete this survey as your feedback is very important to us. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you'll join us again next time.